Hi everyone, this is Dr. Mondal. Welcome to English 314 Online, Module 4, Lecture 11 video. They say, I say model for literary arguments for Jesmyn Ward's Sing Unburied Sing. So the they say, I say method, here abbreviated as TSIS method, is a way of writing academic arguments. And it's relevant to not only literary arguments, but you'll find that if you look at scholarly journal articles in your field, pretty much regardless of discipline, uh, you'll see a very similar structure to what we're talking about. The term they say, I say comes from a book uh, by Kathy Birkenstein and Gerald Graff, um, which basically lays out the they say I say method as a way of thinking about uh, the different kind of pieces of academic writing so the term they say I say or TSIS comes from that book it's a book that's frequently used in composition you may have had uh, that book in your composition course and we're simply using the same model in our class to help us to think about the necessary parts in a scholarly argument so the first thing that I want to do is if you have never used this method before, I want to share with you how it's different from the method called the five paragraph essay that is often taught in high schools. So, uh, and some of you in high school may have gone beyond the five paragraph method, some people do, uh, but this is sort of the typical high school essay that people experience when they're in high school. And as you'll see, it's very different uh, from a, a university level uh, literary argument. So the high school method with the, the five paragraph essay, usually you have an introduction that has a thesis and the thesis is generally some sort of observation. Uh, so for example, if you have read Nathaniel Hawthorne's novel, The Scarlet Letter, which is often assigned in high school, uh, your thesis for a high school paper may have been something like sacrifice is a major theme in Nathaniel Hawthorne's Scarlet Letter. So you already know from what we've talked about with claims that that would not be an acceptable claim for a university level paper um, in part because there's no reason to actually make that argument right anyone who was awake <laughs> while they were reading a scarlet letter the scarlet letter knows that sacrifice is in fact a major theme in that novel right there's no reason to actually write a paper justifying that because everybody already knows that um, but in high school that that may have been an acceptable thesis for you to simply pose uh, an obvious observation that all readers would already know and agree with about a text and then typically after you had your introduction with your thesis you would have had three body paragraphs that all had examples of that observation so you would have found examples from the text uh, and quoted them and said look here's an example of sacrifice in the novel oh look here's another example a few chapters later of sacrifice in the novel oh and here yet is another example of sacrifice in this novel and then you would have a conclusion paragraph that restated your thesis based on these three examples sacrifice is a major theme in this novel so that paper as you can see from my description of it is intellectually not useful right there's, there's nothing that you're advancing there are no ideas that you're advancing or insights that you're advancing that are really new or that are getting anybody who's read the text to think about it on a deeper level but the reason why those are so frequently assigned in high school is that they're extremely useful at teaching people basic writing skills right so you're able to write transitions, you're able to write topic sentences, you're able to learn how to integrate quotations into your paragraphs, you're able to figure out how to logically construct a paragraph where all of the sentences are relevant to the topic sentence, um, you're able to write an introduction and conclusion, you're able to sustain an essay that has some sort of main idea that all of the paragraphs connect to. So there are some, some important things there uh, that the essay teaches, and the audience for this essay in high school was the teacher you weren't thinking about contributing to scholarship on the Scarlet Letter when you wrote a paper about it. It wasn't like, oh, you know, scholars have ignored the fact that sacrifice is a major theme and nobody realizes it and I'm going to be the person to, show, you know, there's nothing like that going on. So at the university level, it's a very, very different kind of game because it's assumed that through that five paragraph essay you kind of know how a paper works in the sense that when i say you have to have a topic sentence you know ah my you know the first sentence or two of my paragraph has to capture what the paragraph's about when i say you need a transition it's like oh yes i need to show that i'm shifting to a different point here so you've learned all of those kinds of skills but now you actually are writing uh, an argument that it is contributing some kind of an insight that's not obvious to everybody who's ever read the book. Um, it's actually requiring some deeper analysis. And your audience, even though I am grading your paper, obviously your audience is me, 
the audience that's intended is the broader scholarly audience. So scholars who are reading Sing Unburied Sing and trying to understand the issues that it addresses better, that's your intended audience. Okay, so it's, it's a different thing. So for a scholarly argument, your introduction and opening paragraph or paragraphs show awareness of existing scholarship on your topic. If you're writing for an audience of scholars, you have to show that you are familiar with the scholarship on the text that you're writing about. And this serves two purposes. One thing that it does is it helps acquaint your reader with what other scholars have said on your topic. So you're kind of setting the stage for your argument by saying, here's what's been written about this so far, you know, and here's, here's what I'm gonna say about it. The other thing is that when you show that you are familiar with scholarship on the novel and on your topic, you are building your credibility. You're showing that you are familiar with what scholars have said about your topic or about the text. You can be trusted as a reliable source about this text as well. Your claim, what you know in high school people called a thesis, is an argument that contributes to existing scholarship, expanding on what literary scholars have written about your topic, and the claim is not an observation. You will find classes at the university where people also call this a thesis. The reason in this class we use the word claim is we're using Stephen Tolman's model of composition, um, and he uses the term claim. He's a composition theorist, and he uses the word claim because it clarifies that you're making an argument. It can't just be an observation. Observation, it has to be an argument. Um, also, your body paragraphs are not all examples of the same obvious thing in the scholarly argument. Each body paragraph is building your argument piece by piece to illustrate the larger claim of the paper. So your claim should be something that's nuanced, it should be sophisticated, and your body paragraphs should build different parts of that claim so that by the time the reader gets to the last body paragraph, they see the larger argument. If all of your body paragraphs are examples of the fact that an obvious theme exists in the novel, you're writing a five paragraph essay. That's, that's not what I'm asking you for. And also the conclusion does not merely restate an obvious observation, but it ends with implications. In other words, what does your argument contribute to the reader's understanding of the time period or of the author's work? And your audience, as I said, is scholars in general. Your purpose is to make a contribution to scholarship on your topic. And in the practice of doing that, in the process of doing that, you're also practicing core skills and just like in high school, uh, earning a grade. So hopefully this contrast between the five paragraph essay and the scholarly argument kind of clarifies uh, the difference in terms of what you may have done before and what I am asking you to do now. So I want to go a little bit more into the they say, I say method. I mentioned on the previous slide that in generally in the second paragraph of your paper, the first paragraph of your paper, you're generally going to kind of introduce the topic. You might bring in one of the sources that you wrote about in discussion board number nine, uh, maybe an interview with Jasmine Ward, uh, maybe a news article, um, something that kind of gets the reader's attention. And then you'll summarize the novel very briefly so that um, um, the reader knows its general plot uh, by the end of the first paragraph. And then your second paragraph, you're going to have this they say, I say. So I want to tell you about what the they say, I say is. They say is basically your scholarly source. What do they or scholars have to say about your topic? The they say is the scholarly conversation to which your claim is responding. So basically you can think of it as what do they scholars say about your topic? That's the they say. I say is your claim. It's the same thing as your claim. It's what you are saying in the paper. It's what your argument is. This is your claim or what you have to say about your topic. So what they say, what the scholars are saying about your topic and what I say, your claim, are connected by a bridge, which explains how you are contributing to the scholarly conversation. So you're going to cite another scholar, and then you're going to explain if you're agreeing with them, if you're disagreeing with them, how you're expanding on what they're saying. And you can see the benefit of this. You're basically establishing your credibility as a writer when you're citing another scholarly source and explaining that you are contributing to the same conversation as that person by making a very specific claim. So you're basically validating your claim. When you have the they say in the bridge, you're saying, look, hey, I'm familiar with what's been written on my 
topic. Here's what's being written. I'm showing you that I'm knowledgeable. I'm showing you that I've looked at what else is out there. And here's how my claim furthers the attention to this topic. Here's how I'm building on what someone else said. Um, so this is a way to build credibility as well as to show uh, your understanding of what's been written uh, about your topic that's relevant to your argument. So now I'd like to show you an example of the they say I say method um, and you can assume that the paper's title, a hook, some introductory sentences and plot summary are in the first paragraph and this would be the second paragraph of the, the whole paper. And I've used kind of a silly example here because the content doesn't really matter, it's the different parts, it's the they say and the I say. Um, so I've used kind of a silly example because I want you to pay attention to the format more than the content. So in his essay titled The Costs and Benefits of Indoor Cat Ownership, nationally renowned cat behaviorist Terence Tabby notes that keeping one's cats solely indoors decreases risk to the cat and to outdoor wildlife, especially birds. Okay, so what I've done here is I've introduced the title of the essay, I've established the author's credibility, by the way, this is made up. There's no one actually named Terrence Tabby that I, that I know of. Um, but in this example, Terrence Tabby, the author, um, I've established their credibility by saying nationally renowned cat behaviorist, right? And I know the title of the essay that I'm talking about. And then that sentence basically explains what the essay is about, right? And then the next sentence is even more specific. I'm going to quote Tabby now. Tabby writes that, quote, although the outdoors offers cats a range of opportunities to pursue their natural instincts through hunting, climbing, stalking, and scratching in ways that are not possible in most indoor domestic settings, the risk to the cat's life and to the local bird population outweigh the benefits, end quotation citation. Okay, so you can see what I've done here. I'm establishing my credibility again, because not only have I introduced the source, established the author's credibility, and explained what their essay is about, but now I've quoted it to demonstrate what their argument is. And the quotation that you pick from your source is gonna be the one that is relevant to your argument. This is the one that you're gonna be building on. So after the page 29 citation, we start to have what I called on the previous slide a bridge. This person is going to be explaining how they're building on Tabby's work. While Tabby is correct that there are formidable risks to cats' safety and well-being when they are outdoors, from being preyed upon by other animals to the dangers of coexisting with human beings and their machines, such as cars, Tabby's delineation of indoor slash outdoor spaces is too severe. Ah, okay, so you can see how this person does that. While so-and-so is correct about X, they don't quite have it right with regard to Y. Do you see that format there? That's that bridge that I was talking about, where this person is explaining how they're gonna build on the work of the other person. So they're kind of, the bridge is kind of making room for your claim. So the bridge continues. He overlooks that in the past decade, a vast variety of protected, quote, outdoor spaces for domesticated cats have emerged, generating a whole industry of, for instance, catios, screened in patios for cats, screened window boxes, and screened tunnels that protrude outside one's home. In fact, it is now possible to bring the outdoors inside for cats without compromising the cat's individual safety or local wildlife. So you see they're, they're kind of showing that Tabby has an oversight. He's not thinking about uh, basically these contraptions that allow cats to be outdoors while still being protected. So here's their claim. This middle ground of indoor-outdoor spaces should be encouraged wherever possible instead of limiting, limiting domesticated cats to a life indoors without external stimulation. That's their argument. So they're agreeing with Tabby to a point by saying that, yeah, outdoor life um, is risky for cats, but they're saying you shouldn't keep cats necessarily confined to the indoors without any exposure to the outdoors. The indoor outdoor spaces should be encouraged. That's their argument. So if you pay attention to how this is laid out, you can clearly see that they say summary of this person's argument, quotation from the argument. You could see the bridge. While Tabby is correct, he overlooks that. And then you see, see the I say. This middle ground should be encouraged instead of limiting cats. So this is the kind of format, obviously your paper isn't about cats, but this is the kind of format, right, that you're following 
uh, for your they say, I say. And again, the I say is the claim, and that's the part you've already been working on. That's the most important thing is to figure out what you're saying first, and then you can look for a source that's about your topic, right? So if you're looking at white supremacy and a certain kind of imagery from slavery in the Jim Crow era, and you're looking at how that gets the reader uh, to be uh, sensitive to the realities of continued white supremacy uh, for black Americans in the American South, um, you would have a claim already right, the last sentence, the middle ground, you would already have that sentence. And so your next step is to start looking for scholars who are talking about your topic. And that's how you have your version of Terrence Tabby, right? You look at other people who are writing about your topic, figure out, do I agree with them? Do I disagree with them? I've got my claim already. How is what I'm arguing responding to what they're saying? And that's, you want to have your claim first, and all your body paragraphs kind of planned out, and then you look for a source on your topic so that you can show um, how you're contributing to the broader conversation. One thing that the they say, I say method does, it provides a structure for the paper. Um, so the claim I already read to you, um, people are like, it's now possible to bring the outdoors inside, the indoor outdoor spaces should be encouraged for cats instead of limiting them. So the paper structure kind of comes from the claim. So first the writer would expand on the first sentence where they're giving plenty of examples of how these different contraptions can allow cats to be outside with protection. And then they would make the case for the second sentence to show that their idea is feasible, right? So they would explain how the indoor outdoor spaces work where cats can be safe, birds aren't harmed. Um, and Terrence Tabby would be cited in the body of the paper wherever relevant to the topic. Um, or either for specific information or for the writer to express agreement or disagreement. So basically, your source would come in the they say, I say, and then you would quote the source again in the body paragraphs of the paper where it's relevant. So you don't need to quote an outside source in every body paragraph that's an arbitrary rule that I don't agree with because a body paragraph does not always have to, there's no reason for that, right? You should only quote people when they're relevant to what you're saying. So in your body paragraphs, um, the body paragraphs that are most closely aligned to the essay that you read, that person's voice would come back in there. You'd have more quotations from them in those body paragraphs. Um, so your scholarly source is gonna appear in two places in your paper. It's gonna be the they say, and then it's gonna be in body paragraphs where their argument is relevant to what you're saying. So now I want to just take a moment to uh, help you come up with um, basically what you're probably wondering by now is, well, what should I use for my they say, right? I know kind of what I'm arguing. How do I how do I find another source? So the primary place to look for the they say is literary criticism. You're writing a literary argument. So the most relevant thing for you to look at would be literary criticism. That means, and you already know how to go into the library databases because the mini paper gave you experience doing this, you would go onto literature relevant databases um, and you would look for information based on that on your topic. I do want to say this, that generally, you know, if I were teaching uh, Jane Eyre or, you know, Ulysses or, or something like that, you would go into literary da databases, EBSCO or JSTOR, Literature Reference Center, whatever it was, and you would be able to find a lot of stuff. This novel was published in 2017. And it takes an extraordinarily long time for a scholarly journal article to make it to print or to screen to be published. Uh, if you're if you're trying to get a peer reviewed scholarly journal article published, it takes a really long time because of the review process, because so many people have to look at it and read it. Oftentimes you have to make revisions before it can be published. So it's unlikely that you're going to find literary criticism specifically on Sing Unburied Sing and scholarly journal articles. So for recent novels, you're going to have to branch further afield. And you're going to have to look at your general topic. You're going to have to look at literary criticism on your general topic instead of literary criticism specifically on this novel. So I've given you some examples of what I mean. You might find criticism on recent novels exploring relationships between African Americans and the police. You might find criticism on writing exploring the aftermath of Hurricane Katrina. You might find criticism on women writers' depictions of the supernatural in writing that provides social critique. So basically, you would be finding literary scholars who are talking about other authors who have recently published on the same topic. And your contribution would be to say that 
One of the most significant novels that also contributes to this topic is Jesmyn Ward's 2017 novel, Sing Unburied Sing. Um, sometimes when you are one of the first people who are writing about a novel, your contribution is basically bringing that novel into the conversation because other people haven't been publishing about it, right? So um, your contribution is to say, hey, people have talked about this topic with other texts. They haven't talked about it with this text, and I want to explore it in this text. And in that case, that would be your they say. And in the body paragraphs that would be more relevant, you would see how the critic or critics have treated other literary works on this topic and see if there are overlaps uh, with what Ward has done in her novel. And you would incorporate that critic as appropriate in your body paragraphs. For some topics, you have to go even broader and look at more popular writing or even relevant films like documentaries. Um, they would still be appropriate for a scholarly source, even though I'm using the word popular. I'm not talking about blogs. I'm not talking about, you know, sort of um, more uh, kind of pop, uh, you know, articles and magazines. I'm not talking about that stuff. I'm talking about books, for example, that are written by people who have a PhD, but they're geared to a more popular audience. They're not necessarily published by academic presses. And by relevant films, I'm talking about documentaries. One that comes to mind is uh, Ava DuVernay's film 13th, if you've seen that, uh, which talks a lot about the criminalization of uh, communities of color uh, and the prison industrial complex. That would be extraordinarily relevant, right, for social kind of context uh, for the book that we read. Um, so these are the kinds of things that I mean. And if your topic is of that nature where you really think that, you know, there's there's an academically appropriate source out there that's a documentary or that's a book and you want to use that, um, you can. You can use that. You just have to make sure that you can justify that uh, in terms of its appropriateness. The last thing I want to say here is that they say source is different from historical and social context. Historical and social context helps your reader to better understand your close reading, right? So if you're talking about Parchman Prison, you would use maybe one of the, the news articles that you found talking about Parchman Prison and its history to help your reader better understand the setting in the body paragraphs that discuss Parchman. They wouldn't be your they say. Um, historical context can't be they say because historical context is not an argument, right? To give a bunch of facts about Parchman and what happened there, nobody's arguing anything there. Someone's just kind of giving you factual information. The same is true for social context. If you're talking about white privilege, information establishing the fact that white privilege exists in the United States, Nobody's arguing that. That's just a fact, right, when you're talking about the history of the United States and the kind of power dynamic that has been created in certain situations. No one's, you know, that's that's an observation about reality. So those things would not be a they say. A they say is an argument someone is making about something, and you are responding to that argument by agreeing or disagreeing or expanding on the argument in some way. So historical and social context should be in your paper. It should be integrated into the body paragraphs where it is relevant. And then the criticism should be part of your they say and also integrated into body paragraphs as relevant. So the next steps I want to share with you, I have extended the deadline for a couple of assignments, and this is based on what I saw in the threads activity. And this really varies from class to class. Sometimes I see the threads activity and I say, this class is good to go, let's keep going. And sometimes I look at it and I say, okay, we need a little bit more time here to revise the threads activity, to get our close readings up to speed, to get our claims up to speed. It is not a commentary at all on you or your work. It just means that I think we need a little more time to address this as a class. Um, so the journal number eight, who cares about this? It's a reflection on what you are looking for in your they say, I say, that will help you to actually search for a source. That's gonna be due on Sunday. The research to actually find a source for your they say, to find a piece of literary criticism. I've extended the deadline to Thursday. Okay, so um, that will be due along with the Thursday assignments. You still have Thursday assignments, so you wanna manage your time really well because you still have those assignments in addition to this one. Um, but I wanna give you a little more time to find a source and then to talk about the source. So discussion board number 10, you're gonna answer some questions about the source that you found. I want you to have some more time to do that. 
And then the rough draft part one is still due Sunday, and you'll see the assignment on Blackboard. Rough draft part one is the first couple of paragraphs of close reading that will be part of the body of your paper, which you will uh, craft using your threads activity. You'll use the brainstorming you did in your threads activity to craft those two paragraphs. That's rough draft part one. So that gives you some idea of what we're doing and also some changes that have been made to accommodate what it seems to me are people's needs in the class. So you can let me know if you have any questions, and I look forward to seeing your work. Thank you.